Hello and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Nursery uh, Garden Report. My name is David and I'm your host. Thank you so much for joining me. So today we're going to play with uh, poop. So here's my worm bin. I'm going to take it apart and um, harvest the uh, worm castings out of the worm farm. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about kind of the care and the maintenance of, uh, of a worm farm, your own little uh, poop factory. So um, before we get into this, let's talk a little bit about what we have going on in the nursery. So um, we have uh, up and ready for sale, uh, beautiful mint. We still have a good amount of uh, Florida native milkweed back here. Um, we have lots of African blue basil. We also have our tomatoes are coming up. Uh, most of our heat tolerant varieties are kind of what's up first. Our uh, slicing tomatoes will be ready in just a few weeks. Um, so we've got the uh, sun gold tomatoes. We've got Roma tomatoes. We have, um, uh, oh, we're out of the homestead, but we have the Floridade tomatoes, uh, all available in four packs right now, but they are getting a little bit big and we're gonna be potting them up into four inch pots very soon, which means the price goes up. So right now, if you purchase uh, tomato plants in four packs, you're actually getting a really good deal because you're getting a rather large plant um, for, you know, four plants for $5 rather than spending $5 on one plant once we pot them up into four inch pots. Um, we also have lots of peppers. Um, we still have tons of other Florida native uh, flowers. Uh, the scarlet sage, um, is looking really good. We also have uh, Coreopsis, lots of Coreopsis, and we still have a little bit of Roselle. We're actually, the Roselle, kind of same story. Um, they are larger plants right now, but we're about to put them in one gallon pots. Um, it's definitely too late in the year to get seeds in the ground, but it's not too late to plant Roselle. So if you want to try cranberry hibiscus, Jamaican sorrel, whatever you want to call it, or true Roselle, you got to get it in the ground now. Um, we're also about to get rid of um, the rest of our stock on okra. We're just moving on. We're moving out of the summer stuff and getting all ready for our fall stuff. We also have lots of squash, melons, and cucumbers uh, for sale as well. So on the gardening front, not really much more to report other than kind of what we had going on last week. Um, you know, all of our corn that we planted is, is pretty big. So it's all doing really well. I think I told you guys I'm doing an experiment with a couple different types of heirloom corn. Hopefully that works out. And um, in the spring, we'll have some heirloom corn for you uh, for sale. Um, we're just still clearing out beds of summer stuff. Um, all of our beds that had cow peas in them, we're chopping, uh, chopping that stuff down and turning that stuff into the soil. And again, just making room for uh, that cool down that is going to happen eventually. I'm not sure exactly when. I know I'm sitting out here sweating right now and it's crazy to be talking about cool weather crops, but all of our warm weather crops, we kind of got that stuff started a few weeks ago. Uh, we're planting a little bit more now, um, but really all, over the next couple of weeks, our focus is going to be on the more heat tolerant, cool weather crops. So um, that would be broccoli, cabbage, collard greens, kale, uh, stuff like that so that you know basically your greens that have a little bit thicker leaves carrots uh, It's not too early to get started on carrots if you can get them to germinate um, Typically they need temperature soil temperatures below 75 to germinate really well, but um, I mean I've seen them germinate a little bit higher and uh, the, the, the smaller plants can definitely handle the heat you don't really need it to cool off until those carrots are thinking about, you know, actually forming carrots. So if you can get them started now, you'll be a little bit ahead of the game. So um, that's really it. Oh, we got lots of people watching today. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I have got to go uh, run and grab something really quick so that when I harvest this, uh, the worm castings out, um, I have some more to put them. I forgot that. I brought everything. I got my cameras. I got my microphone. I got all set up. I didn't bring anything to put the worm poop in. So let me clear a spot here for it too. And I'll be right back.
So this is it, guys. I forgot my cookie sheet. So this is a giant full-size cookie sheet. Um, it's definitely what I like to use to dry out the worm castings on. If you don't have one of these, uh, something that might be a little more readily available to you. I've used these before, um, but I know today I have a lot of worm castings in here. So basically this week um, at my school gardens, uh, during my live shoot this morning, there was lots of uh, live shoot on, um, on WTVT, Good Day Tampa Bay. By the way, that's every Thursday morning at 8.15 on channel 13. Um, I do a three minute live uh, segment on what I'm doing in the garden. But today it was supposed, supposed to be raining. It wasn't raining right when we did the segment, but I had to get out my worm bin and the school garden I was at yesterday was raining. So we had to do it undercover and I couldn't get out to the garden. So I've been humping this thing around all week and I realized just how heavy it is. <laughs> I actually haven't really been down in the layers in quite some time um, to really see what was going on down here. So I can tell you um, I've been, I have been going in the top layer because I've been adding food scraps to it, um, but not really digging around in it. And that's what we're going to do today. So got a couple people saying hi hi Marie hi Christina thanks for watching you guys so um, I did a little fancy camera work here check this out it's my phone and we're gonna see how this works out so let me bring in the other camera and you guys are welcome to pipe in at any time and uh, and if you have any questions and I will try to get to them uh, my hands are going to get pretty dirty here, so. Hi, Anna Maria. Yeah, we're doing a live tutorial DIY on the worm bin today. So let me tell you a little bit about how this is built. Um, I'm going to try and move it around as little po as possible because it's kind of on the same table as my cameras. So if I move it around too much, we might get a lot of camera shaking. But essentially, these are three 10-gallon tubs. Um, I picked them up at Home Depot. I don't think they have this exact brand anymore, but these were Rubbermaid, Roughneck. Um, I experimented with a lot of different types of containers over the years, and I found that these hold up the best. Um, some of the, some of the, uh, yes, Christina, I've been dealing with roaches all week too. Every time I open this thing up, they scatter and everybody laughs and screams and everything. But yes, roaches are definitely part of this. I'm not gonna lie to you. So um, anyway, these are roughneck, uh, rubber made, rubber made roughneck containers, 10 gallons. And I basically take the top two containers. I don't know if y'all can see this, but there's three containers here. The top two containers, I just drill a heck of a lot of holes in them, like a giant colander. And then that way the worms can move backward and forward in between each uh, tub and it gets plenty of airflow. This bottom container here, again, I can't really pick it up, it only has holes like you can see them right along the bottom here. So those holes are right above where the container above it drops down to. And I keep this under my carport. I've kept them outside before. You do need to protect them from direct sunlight because they can get too hot. So I've had them in gardens before where we like put a bunch of palm fronds over it and throw a brick on top. That's fine. But the, the, the holes in the bottom for, are for added airflow, but they're also down there just in case something happens and the lid blows off and it gets rained inside the worms aren't going to drown so this bottom container is able to kind of let let water out so the whole thing doesn't fill up with water on one side on the bottom container just on one side down here again i know y'all can't see it but on one side down here i do have holes drilled that is to collect your worm tea so this sits in my carport on top of cinder blocks a little bit offset and then I have a container underneath that so any leachate that is building up in here will drip down into the bottom container and kind of ooze out of those front holes for me to collect my worm tea so that's it in a nutshell kind of the um, the idea behind this I've, I've built many many of these over the years and before that before I kind of settled on this design I built many many more that did not work um, the drill holes are quarter inch drill holes and like I said, the uh, the top two containers are just filled with a hell of a lot of holes um, so that the worms can pass through uh, easily and that you get plenty of airflow. So let's see what's inside. Okay. So just your typical garbage. 
So we have just some uh, paper products, lots of paper products, some old bananas. Um, so this top container is where I'm adding the scraps, right? This is where I'm adding my scraps. And uh, the, the second container, which is what we're about to get into, that's what I'm gonna harvest from today. And so I'm gonna go through the whole process. I'm probably gonna have to pick this thing up and put it back up here a few times just to get to the layers um, so you know what I'm doing and why I'm doing that. Anyway, this top container is where I'm adding uh, my carbons, which is the paper products, and my nitrogens, which are the kitchen scraps. It's definitely better for your worm bin to be higher in carbons than it is to be uh, to have too much nitrogen. If you have too much nitrogen, food scraps and such, it can get stinky and the worms don't like that. So that smell that when you smell like trash, rotting trash, that's an ammonia gas that's building up and it can choke the worms out. Um, so you don't want your worm farm to get stinky. So uh, lots of carbon that definitely helps shredded paper. Uh, if you have a paper shredder, you can just throw your mail right in here. Um, I've neglected my worm farm before and uh, only had shredded paper in and they ate it. They weren't happy. They didn't really multiply too much. Um, but basically, um, eggshells, food scraps, kitchen scraps. I don't put any meat, cheese, processed food in here. Um, just, you know, vegetable clippings and mail. I do put coffee in here. I do put coffee in here. Coffee grounds. So, anywho, um, you know, the worms are down in here hanging out with the roaches and the earwigs and all the other bugs and stuff. Um, I've already kind of dug around in here over the over the course of the week. And I know that most of the worms have made their way up into this top container. So again, the thought process here, so I'm sure you guys want to see worms. There they are. So the process here, the thought process here is we are not adding any scraps to the second container. The second container used to be the top container. I harvested this container, which used to be the second container and then I flipped the containers and that's what we're gonna do today. So then you're adding scraps only to the other one and the one that has all the worms in it, this top one is gonna be the new second one and they are going to uh, finish off what's in there and make their way into the new top one um, that I'm adding scraps to. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk through that whole thing. Lost me at roaches on this morning show, exactly, yeah. Um, it's not for the faint heart, and I don't like to candy coat it. Um, there's definitely a lot of bugs in here, um, but there's definitely not a smell. Um, I mean, I put lettuce in here last night, so it smells a little bit like hot lettuce. Um, but for the most part, there shouldn't really be that much of a smell, and your worms should be active. If you're ever starting a worm bin and you find all your worms like balled up in a corner and there's any type of smell or the stuff seems too wet, um, you're probably creating an environment that they're not very happy in and um, they could leave or they could die. So as long as they're happy in here and I keep them fed, even though there's holes throughout the whole thing, they're not going anywhere. So anyways, this is the top container. We're going to go ahead and move that out of the way. Oh yeah. I don't know if y'all can see that. There's all kinds of crawlies in here. Look at that. Let's see here. Yeah, look at that. Oh, yeah. So, like I said, not for the faint at heart, but so this container here, I'm sure y'all can see that, is pretty much pure worm deck. These are compostable bags. I've actually been moving them from section to section every time I've done this for quite some time now, but we're just going to go ahead and pick that stuff out. Hey, Rebecca, on the on the shelf, like where we keep all the stuff for the fertilizer, there's a Ziploc bag filled with my dried worm castings. Can you bring that? Thanks. So I always just kind of go through it to make sure that there aren't really any worms in here. But as you can see, this is the good stuff. So this is the second container. Container number two. And 
you know, since I'm shredding mail, I'll put boxes and bags in here. Um, sometimes there'll be like tape or like on envelopes. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, you know, on envelopes, the plastic uh, window, I'll forget to take that off before I shred the paper. So I'll find that stuff in here. So sometimes there is some cleaning out of trash that did not uh, decompose and that you don't want in here, but we're going to do that at a later step. Um, so where's my giant cookie sheet? Here we go. So we are just going to take this stuff out and we are going to spread it on out on top of this cookie sheet. And then I will put it up on top of a shelf in my carport to let all this stuff dry out. Um, I know that raising your own worms and making your own fertilizer can seem sort of romantic, but you know, I want no doubt in your mind. Oh, there's some worms that you are probably going to be dealing with some six legged bugs of the roach variety. So, you know, if you can't handle that or don't have kids that can do that for you, this is, uh, might not be your thing. That's okay. We all don't need a thing like this. So I just try and kind of dig through it and find any worms that are in here. Most of them, like I said, have moved up into the top layer. The reason I don't want to leave them in here is because I'm about to put this somewhere and let it dry out. Let's see, there's a piece of trash. And uh, I don't want them to die. Oftentimes, though, as this kind of dries out, I'll check on it every few days. And as it dries out, they'll be wet spots. And that's kind of where the worms might be kind of moving to and congregate. So I'm still going to check this every few days to see if I can't find anybody that got left behind. Um, I'll tell you what, with my worm bin, this is a great place to germinate mango seeds. I have amazing, amazing luck germinating mango seeds. Well, I don't know how amazing of a luck I have. All my mango seeds basically go in here and any that pop up, if I want them, I plant them. So the reason I'm saying it might not be that amazing, I mean, I might only be getting half germination. I don't really pay attention. It's just when I go in here to add stuff, if I have mangoes growing and I want to plant them, I plant them. I'm sure if you had some specialty mango seed, there's probably better ways to do it, but it's kind of a, uh, I don't, the way I like to do it, I don't have to think about it. So, pure worm poop, y'all. The good stuff. So we are going to get all this out. Well, not all of it. Get all those roaches. Man. All right. Anybody want a cake? I'm cooking cake tonight on my sheet pan. So we are going to leave some behind. That's very important. So there it is. Okay. I'm just going to set that down. All right. So as you can see in here, I did not get all of it out right? So I want to take what's left. Uh, still some worms in there. Yeah. So I'm going to take what's left. And I'm going to kind of evenly spread this around. Okay. Like that. And then Move this out of my way. So I'm just going to set this back here. Right there. And I'm going to now bring up the first container. So here was the original first container, right? And I'm going to pull everything out of here that is recognizable 
okay? So if it kind of looks like what it looked like when you put it in, we're going to pull it out, okay? So that's all this goodness. We got some bananas and some kiwis and some receipts. Tell you what, this is identity theft. Ultimate identity theft. Shred your mail and feed it to the worms. Okay, so as you can see, I'm just kind of scraped. I'm not worried about where the worms are at this point. So I'm just getting out everything that kind of looks like something. Okay, and what's left? Look, fork. All kinds of goodies in here. Get rid of that. So I know this looks like a lot of worm dirt, but it's actually a lot of coffee. There's a lot of coffee in here. I can tell by the smell. I can tell by the way it feels. But anyway, this is where the majority of my worms are right now in this container, right? Can y'all see them? Okay, so the majority of the worms are in here. Now, the second container I just harvested now becomes my new top container. Oh, see, now you can see the holes in it. There's all kinds of holes in the bottom of this thing. Uh, can you all see that? Okay, so this was the second container that I harvested from becomes my new top container. And this is the container I'm adding my scraps to. No more scraps in the second container. They're gonna make their way up into this container and in a couple months, I'll be able to harvest this container and the process just continues. Um, I don't know if y'all can see it. Here's the bottom one. You can see the holes just on the one side right here. So that's where my worm tea drips out from. Okay, so this is the bottom container. And we are going to just put another fork. These all these forks get in here. We're just gonna put it back together. And that's it. So we have now harvested our worm dirt and put our container back together. And this is gonna go under my carport by the kitchen door where we can easily throw our mail and our scraps. So that's it. Pretty simple. I mean, minus the roaches. Um, so these particular worms that I use are called European red wigglers. And they are great for container, small container composting like this. I'm going to leave this open for you guys. Maybe I'll just keep playing with the worms while I talk. So, um, ooh, guys, look, I found this in here. Actually, the kids found this in here the other day. Tell me what y'all think that is. It's sprouting. They said they thought it was coffee. It doesn't really look like a bean. Y'all see that? But if that's coffee, that's weird because the coffee that would have ended up in here would be roasted. I mean, it really doesn't look like a peanut. Maybe it is peanuts. I don't know. What do y'all think that is? I have no idea. I'm going to plant it and see what comes out. And then take it back to my kids at the school. Um, anyway, these are European wigglers. Um, where they live, where they're from, they exist in the top couple inches of the forest floor. They don't like soil, so they actually like to live in what they're eating. Um, so these are not soil dwelling worms. They live in the detritus level of the forest floor. These are not native worms, so I don't recommend getting them and throwing them out in your garden. Um, I don't recommend. So basically where I have this in my carport, these worms are not going to get very far if they get out before they dry up on the concrete. So I really recommend if you're going to try this, that you make sure you are uh, 
composting in a location that the worms cannot get out. Our native worms are soil dwelling worms. So basically these guys actually eat the garbage. Like that is their food source. They have a raspy tongue and they slough off the banana peel and that's actually their food. Uh, each worm can eat up to like one to five times its body weight. Actually, it's like a quarter to five times its body weight a day, depending on, you know, where it's at in its its growth cycle. Um, which if you have, you know, a quarter pound or a pound of worms in a worm bin, that, that adds up. So I know each worm doesn't weigh very much, but you're looking at the totality of your worm colony and what it can consume. Um, they are E. Fotada. E. Fotada? Fotida is the uh, scientific name of this worm. So they're also called red wigglers or tiger worms. We have a native Florida red wiggler, which is a soil dwelling worm, and it will not do very well in a small container like this. They like a lot of soil. So not only do these worms eat the scraps, um, our native worms prefer to bring in lots of soil and they're going after more like the microbes and stuff. So between our night crawlers and the Florida wigglers, and I'm sure there's other types, most of our worms here are soil dwelling worms. They also are native worms, native. I keep saying native because I don't know if any worms are native to the continental US, but it's another argument for another day. Um, because they're soil dwelling worms, they cannot handle extreme temperature changes. So they, the way they eat, they like to bring in lots of dirt. It's like a whale brings in a lot of water and then kind of rinses out the water and eats the plankton and krill, right? So they bring in a lot of dirt, <clears throat> their body filters out what they want out of the dirt and they poop the dirt out. They also can't handle extreme temperature changes. So as it gets too hot or too cold for them, they burrow down into the soil. So they're always going up and down and up and down. That's why they're great in your garden because they aerate the soil and they add their poop to your garden. These guys are terrible in your garden because again they do not like to be in the soil um, they like to be in the detritus layer okay so between the uh, european red wigglers which is what i have their ability to handle extreme temperature changes because you know where they live on the top couple inches of the forest floor they have to be able to handle extreme temperature changes um, their hellacious appetites and the fact that they eat this stuff and they don't need soil nor want soil to climb down into makes them perfect container vermicomposting worms. Um, so that's the worms that we use in our container vermicomposting systems. And we uh, keep the native worms for our larger outdoor uh, composting systems and for in our garden, okay? So mostly if you put native worms in here, they're just gonna leave or die. They, they, they really, really will not be happy. Um, so this is also, it's a colony worm. So they kind of group together um, and they have like big worm orgies <laughs> where the, uh, even though each worm is asexual, um, they do prefer sexual uh, reproduction um, and basically, uh, you know, two worms can produce a, um, a cocoon after they have mated. So basically the little ring around their neck, that piece of skin, um, will come off and they, they roll it up off the top of their head. Like you're pulling your sock off inside out and inside that cocoon, it closes is filled with their body fluids. And that's actually where reproduction occurs. And each cocoon can have like between one and six worms inside of it. So if you ever see them grouped together, they're probably making your colony larger. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty much I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Don't put them in direct sunlight. Make sure they're getting good airflow. Make sure it doesn't get stinky. Oh, treat this thing like a pet. This is not a garbage can. So if you start feeding it and the food's not going away, don't feed it more. Um, that's one of the big mistakes I, I, when I'm talking to people about why their worms, uh, their worm colonies don't make it is they just start putting all their kitchen scraps in there. And what happens is there's too many kitchen scraps and they can't keep up with it. It goes anaerobic, produces that ammonia gas and it suffocates them and they die. 
So you really don't want to uh, overfeed your worm farm. If you ever have to go away for a while or you know that you're not going to be really good at feeding them green kitchen scraps regularly or you're afraid you're going to overfeed them or, or underfeed them, lots and lots of shredded paper. So if you just keep this thing filled with shredded paper, um, they'll eat that. They'll eat it slowly. It's not their favorite food, um, but it is something that they can consume so they won't die. So um, this, anybody who tuned in many, many months ago when I did this before, are some of the worm castings left from the last time I, uh, I harvested. And I wanted you all to see this. Okay. This is what dried worm castings look like. Minus all the garbage, right? See that? They're hard as a rock. They're crumbly. Oops. I can not see that. They're hard as a rock and they're crumbly. They're like, they're not moist at all. I mean, I've bought worm castings at the store before and they don't, they're like fluffy. Um, I've never been able to produce worm castings that look like that. I'm halfway convinced that when you buy a bag of worm castings, half of it is whatever bedding that they use uh, for the worms. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, I've pulverized this before um, and it just does not have that same, you know, light, fluffy texture as when you buy worm castings at the store. This is how worm castings always felt when I was a kid playing in my garden. Um, you know, when they make their little castles. Um, yeah, Christina, I think it's mostly whatever they're using for bedding. Um, so, you know, that's one of the benefits of making this, uh, making this on your own. The other thing I want to point out is if your worm bed has a lot of scraps in it or worm dirt that they're breaking down, um, don't pour a bunch of water over it all at once because I, even if you have a store-bought worm farm, it, if it gets too wet all at once, um, it could get, it could go anaerobic. So sometimes I might pour just a little bit of water over it, but mostly now I'm just trying to get this, my worm castings. Great fertilizer. Um, this is like recycling to the nth degree. See, there's some pulverized stuff at the bottom of this bag, and it's more like sand than that light fluffy stuff when you buy worm castings at the store. So I don't know what it is or if they have a different method. It's just not dried out all the way. But here's the thing, when this stuff's wet, it's still not light and fluffy. So it's more like sand. It's all gritty like sand. So when this stuff gets wet, even this stuff, it turns into like peanut butter. It's not light and fluffy. So it goes from peanut butter to hard and crumbly, like right away. There's no light, fluffy, slightly moist in between stage whatsoever. So anybody got any questions about worm farming? I'm sure um, y'all do. If you are watching this episode later on and you have any questions about worm farming, um, you can post them to our Facebook page. You can message us on Facebook. You can send us an email at info at witwomorganics.com. And um, so, yeah, that's going to be it for the episode today. Um, if you have any other gardening questions or topic suggestions, you can also uh, send those to us on Facebook Messenger, or you can email them to us at info at witwomorganics.com. Don't forget to check out our website witwomorganics.com, uh, where you can buy all of these great plants. We also have seeds. We have drip irrigation supplies. We have all the organic fertilizer, and we also do local deliveries of uh, great organic garden soil 
and compost. So let's see. So you have the worm castings. When do you use it? I use it whenever I'm planting new plants. You just use it like an organic fertilizer. But it's really light, so it's very hard to overdo it. So, oh yeah, thank you, Michelle. So guys, we are taking pre-orders right now for bare root strawberry plants. Um, if you go on the website under live plants and available seedlings, uh, you can just um, click on the little uh, tab at the top left and filter through types of vegetables or scroll through all of our live plants and available seedlings, or just search strawberries up in the search tab um, and bring them up. The strawberry plants, the bare root strawberry plants, we'll be, we'll be getting them in around the first week of October. And that's when, if you choose pick up at checkout, you'll be able to pick them up. Or if you get them shipped, we'll start shipping them out uh, right then. Uh, Michelle says there's also a post on our uh, on our business Facebook page. So yeah, that's it. I don't know about you guys, but I wake up every morning right now and I check the weather. I look at the two week forecast. I cannot wait uh, for fall um, for this weather to cool off. Um, I know this time of year, August, September, I just dread going outside during the day just because it's so hot and miserable. But guys, fall is almost here and so is the cooler weather and our main peak gardening season. So thank you everybody for joining me um, and I will see you guys next week.